I want to show you a statement in just a moment, and I want you to, to think about whether you agree, disagree, or maybe even have a stronger response to it, but I, I would be hard-pressed to believe you have no thoughts on the matter. Marley, go ahead and put that up for me. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I've been in ministry for over 20 years. This is not my first time hearing this statement. Heard it in the first service. Uh, can I tell you, though, I agree with this statement? I think this is absolutely true. You, going to church does not make you a Christian. The only thing that makes you a Christian is giving your life to Jesus, giving your whole life to Jesus, changing your mind, going in a new direction, repenting of your sins, and becoming born again through the spirit of the living God. The only thing that actually makes you a Christian is not your church attendance, which for some of you is a confirmation because you haven't been attending church very much, or for others you might be a challenge because you were depending on that good, that perfect attendance to be able to get you in, but it's not going to church that makes you a Christian. What about this statement, though? The next one. I don't need to go to church to be a disciple. I think we're getting into some trickier territory now with this one. Because Jesus never called us to actually become Christians. The Apostle Paul was not trying to convert people into being pew sitters or seat fillers, mainly because people didn't use pews or seats in the church until about 500 years ago. I mean, he wasn't trying to get us to just become church members or volunteers. He, he was always calling us. Paul was always calling us. Peter was always calling us. Jesus was always calling us to be disciples of Christ, to be ones who learned about him, to put into practice what they were learning, and looked for the opportunity to share that with others. You do not need to go to church, to be a Christian. But you should want to go to church to become a better disciple. Because I believe that the local church is the training ground for discipleship. The local church is the training ground for discipleship. I say training ground and not the entirety of it because you know that we are called to not only be Christians on Sundays, on Wednesday night students or whenever your discipleship community meets, but every day. Uh, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be that every single day, and not everybody out there is trying to serve Jesus. And so we actually start learning how to be able to follow Jesus with other people who are imperfect but love God, so that when we meet other people who are imperfect and don't give a rip about God, we go, okay, I've had some practice dealing with this circumstance. I mean, have you ever met Christians who don't have it figured out yet? If not, look to the left and right of you real quick. Have you ever met people who don't give any care about following God and are just trying to do whatever is best for themselves? Oh, it's a little more difficult to serve God around those folks. And so the church is a local church, is a training ground for discipleship. Now, a couple weeks ago, maybe about two months ago now, I found on Spotify a five-minute vocal warm-up that is the perfect time for my drive into church every Sunday morning. And so we start with the mums. And then we go to the, I even get to the, I, Mason told me I had to squeeze when I, sometimes my lips are too dry. And then we, we end with the goos. Goo, 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 goo. And then we go the whole scale up and down. You go, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I'm telling you, I had to warm up the vocals this morning because I'm very passionate and excited about this message because we're going to talk about the local church. And I love the local church. I love it. I, I, I have given my life to it. I love this local church. This is a great local church. Okay, good. First service was like, <laughs> let's see how the message goes. I'm not convinced yet. There's a lot of diehard villains in the first uh, service. No, and 
I have gotten to travel around uh, to, to other countries, to preach in other churches. To I've had people who travel the world who come to this church. And so I can say, not just from my opinion of just being with you week after week, but from all around the world, this is an incredible church, not because just of the leaders, but because of you guys who are in it. So when you hear me this morning, my passion for the local church, I'm not bringing a rebuke to this church, but just a reminder of the treasure and passion that we have here at TNLC. But notice I didn't say a perfect church because I actually don't think those exist in the way people want them to. There are no perfect churches. All of them have cracks. All of them have problems. All of them have struggles. All of them have lacks. All of them have people making mistakes from sides of authority, from sides of receptivity, and over and over again. And it's amazing because of that how much disdain Christians have for the very thing that Jesus called his bride. If people talked about my bride, the way that people are casually talking about Jesus' bride, I'll have to lay hands suddenly on some folks. <laughs> the local church is not a punching bag. It is not something that people get to say what's wrong with so that they get to sell books and speak at conferences. It's not an Instagram slide deck of all the things that the church is not doing posted by people who are not even inside the church to be able to do anything about it. The church of Jesus Christ is his bride and it is okay to love it. I love it. I don't love the idea of it. I love this local church. I love you all. And as we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, we're looking at the foundation that the church should be built on, the result of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We've used this passage every week to talk about the foundation that a person's life is built on. Acts 2.37, Peter's words about who Jesus was pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the other apostles, well, what do we do in response to this? So he said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, to those who are follow, far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. How does an individual become a Christian? You first need to hear the right gospel, that Jesus is both Lord and Savior. Yes, he rescues us from eternal separation from God, but he is also the one interested in our thoughts, attitudes, choices, and behaviors. He is both Lord and Savior. And as a result of that, what we need to do is repent. We have got to change our mind and go in a new direction. Now, that's an internal transformation. And so the way that we show on the outside what's happened on the inside is through water baptism, which is both a human ceremony and a spiritual event that is not optional, but an initiation into the very kingdom of God. And in that salvation moment, we are receiving the Holy Spirit, as we talked about last week, who does not come to rest on us for a moment and then leave, but comes to rest and remain in us in a brand new way. Now, the next verse that we're gonna pick up here in verse 41, we start to see what people did as a result of hearing the right gospel, repenting, being baptized, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't have a template to follow. This is what began to come out of them and the way their lives were shaped as a result of this Spirit-filled life. All those who believe what Peter said were baptized, added to the church that day, 3,000 in all. All the believers, not just the leaders, not just the discipleship group leaders. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The first response to this brand new, transformed, internal to external, Holy Spirit-led life was that they started rearranging the patterns and practices of all of their daily life. And they, what was birthed out of that, these new patterns and new practices are what we call the local church. And they were not dragged into it. It wasn't like they responded, brothers, 
What should we do? And do we have to go to church if we respond to your message, Peter? They just started gathering together. Nobody drug them to church. They were dragging each, they were running together to say, let's meet together. Let's spend our lives together. Let's rework the very patterns and practices of who we are so that we might be able to form something new on the earth and spur each other on towards love and proclamation of who Jesus is. But it was not all roses and candies and good times and high fives. Right from the beginning, there were problems. There was no utopic time of the, of the church. Right from the beginning, there were challenges, differences, confusion, differences of opinion, opposition, slander, attack from the inside and attack from the outside. So if the history of the church is no matter when, it's always had problems and opposition, why even engage in it? Why bother with the local church? Because I absolutely believe that the local church is the training ground for discipleship. And we, who belong to God, are called, at minimum, to be disciples. So we're going to look at a few of the ways that the local church changed the patterns and practices of their life. First thing, Acts 2.46. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. They were meeting together every day day. How much of your time does Jesus have lordship over? How much of your schedule does Jesus have lordship over? How much of the rhythm of your family's life does Jesus have lordship under, over? How under the lordship of Jesus is your time I think one of the smartest ways to stay undiscipled is to never make church services and church life a regular priority and part of your schedule. Because when you do that, when you're around, but not regular, not routine in it, you're able to stay in your own world. You're not around people enough to get pushback from them. You're not being challenged by them. They may not know you well enough to feel comfortable pushing you on some things, nor might you be around them enough to let things, let the mask down enough that they actually see the things that might be able to help you become more like Christ. I know that there are some of you in our description of Fight Club, we're talking about having greater victory in our lives, are already like, nope, not going to that. I can't let anyone know that I'm struggling in any part of my life, as if you would be the one who's not struggling in any part of your life. If you're not challenged, you're not exposed to the word on a regular basis, and you're not exposed to the mistakes of people on a regular basis. Because being exposed to the mistakes of people gives you the opportunity to demonstrate grace, mercy, and to grow as a disciple, just in the same way that you probably hope that they will extend to you grace and mercy and love as you are growing in your own discipleship and what it means to follow and obey God. I've just spent the last eight weeks in a seminary class called Historical Theology. We've been reading portions of, of uh, theologians for the last 2,000 years, from Polycarp to Augustine to Kuiper to Calvin to uh, 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 Karl Barth and, and Phoebe Palmer and John Wesley and Craig Groeschel. And that was actually one of the weeks we had to pit uh, John Calvin from the 1500s against Craig Rochelle, Captain Life Church, Second Life, Meta Church himself, to say, what is the church? And you know what? There is no debate among all of these major theologians over the history of the church that when the church can gather, it must gather, that it must be in person. Even again, Life Church, which is the most forward thinking technological church that is out there, they are using all of these online reach, uh, outreaches, they have said to pull people into physically meeting and gathering together. It is not only a necessity that the church gathers, but for the church body to be the manifest presence of God on the earth, it has got to gather on a regular basis. 
And boy, doesn't that take time? That takes so much time. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no expectation that you are in church every Sunday. I'm not in church every Sunday. But I wonder if you've ever said no to a single event that you've been invited to and said, sorry, we have church on Sunday. We're well, like, it's just a one-off thing. Okay, maybe it is good to go to that. How many one-offs over 52 weeks piled up? How many sports leagues did you say, well, I know they have that on Sunday morning, but it's only going to be for 12 weeks, and then we'll take some time off, except for it's Florida. So your sports leagues actually never take any time off, which is why every 12th grader is getting Tommy John surgery for the baseball that they play. You go, but I don't want to rob my kids of anything. Do you, you don't think that keeping them out of church is robbing them of anything? Listen, it's time to be honest. Your kid's probably not going pro in that sport. <laughs> now, that's the easy way out. But I will tell you, there's nothing wrong with signing your kids up for things just so they can have fun. But please remember, there are a multitude of spiritual, physical, and natural legacies that you are looking to hand down. And if you think not letting, if you think withdrawing your kids and your family from church isn't robbing them of something. I wonder if you understand how important the local church is to be a training ground of discipleship in your life. I mean, how many of you are willing to give up a morning or an evening at the gym or some sleep or your Netflix queue for a discipleship community? I mean, be honest, the thing that most of you watch on Netflix anyways is the menu. And you're like, no, no, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I don't, no, no. And you're like, oh, I've been doing this for 45 minutes. Time to go to bed. You know what I mean? Like, if Netflix just had an animated cue going around their menu, you'd be like, it's my favorite show. I, you know? <laughs> it's, I, I don't think, that, you know, people are like, oh, man, I wish I could go to a discipleship community. I just don't have the time. You do. But everything is trying to take your time. Everything is. If you're waiting for the opening in your schedule, you're probably going to be waiting for a long time. It's whether you say, well, this is important to me, and so I put this as this value. Pastor Mason has a discipleship community group that meets at 6.30. Uh, I think it's at Russ's house. A a yeah, a.m. Yeah, sorry, a.m. Only, only the person whose house it's at, I think, gets to wake up at 6.25. Everybody else is probably maybe getting up with a number that's a five. You know, that's not worth it. I go to bed at 12, you know, 1230 every night because I got to watch my shows. Well, you know, it's like people say, like, I, could just, I would do anything to get eight hours of sleep. Have you thought about going to bed eight hours before you got to get up? Oh, can't do that. You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like Fight Club. And you're like, oh, I don't want to. Uh, uh, I mean, I've been traveling a ton over the last two weeks. Kelly and I have barely seen each other. And I'm like, Friday night, it'd be a great night for a date night. Uh, I don't know, what are we doing? Fight, uh, men's events? I don't really love men's events. You know, I'm not going to Fight Club because I love men's events. I'm going to Fight Club because I love you. So if you're like, oh, that's not really my thing, men's events. Like, I, take, a, take the word away, event away and be like, oh, man, hanging out with men in my church, not really my thing. Oh, okay. So... You go, yeah, but it's just not the kind of activity that I like. And so I, you only go to activities that you like. I'm like, well, the next time we have a different men's event, it's like a poetry slam or something like that. And people are like, then the other men are like, that's not really my thing. And it's like, well, it is based on those hands motions. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and you go, well, I just don't know if I want to love the thing we're going to do. I don't care if you love the thing we're going to do. I need you to love the people you're going to do the thing with. And it just takes time. You're like, but I don't know anybody. I don't know how to more to say it takes time. They met together every day. Every, that's not prescriptive, that's not instructive, that's descriptive. Of there was such a radical change and transformation inside of them that they wanted to be with them more and more and more. And if you come to church that often, if you're in church, let's call it 45 of 52 Sundays, and you're in a discipleship community, 
and then you hang out with some of those people outside of it, boy, let me tell you something. The local church is going to become the training ground for discipleship in your life. Let's read another verse. Hey, it's the same verse, Acts 2.46. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Now, we just met with the, we just talked about the every day. Now we're going to talk about the word they met together. They met together. The people gathering were not all of the same background and upbringing. They were learning to deal with people from different ethnic backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, different political backgrounds, different music tastes. And all of that interaction with that is an opportunity for discipleship. Studies have shown more and more over the last eight years that people are not only looking for a church that they go to for people to already vote the way that they do, but they are now actually moving towns, moving states to find people who already think, believe, and act like them. And the kingdom of God is too diverse for one political party, one musical genre, one gender, one skin color, one economic status, one age range, one type of personality, one type of thought, one type of thing. We need a diversity to actually fully represent the body of Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul jumps in Acts chapter 12 and he starts describing it as a body. And you can't be like as an elbow. You're like, I can do whatever I want. I don't need fingers to do what I want. Yes, but if you don't have the fingers, then you don't get the heart right here so you can properly do what the elbow and the hand are created. You know, and it just feels so good. It just feels so good. Justin, you just got to want to run around, want to run around a little bit. Uh, Anyways, you need that diversity. You need different parts. You go, nobody here is like me. Oh, so you're a part to make the body whole. Nobody here is my age. Go, thank God you're here. Because then when you stick, the next person who comes and goes, no, there's nobody here. There's that person. Okay, so I can be seen here. This church is full of stories over the last 15 years of people who stuck because God told them to and not because the circumstances of the church were the right thing, and that unlocks something else going on in people's lives. Because listen, I know some of you have been in churches and a lot of different churches. I, I have a, a different unique perspective. I have been in one church for 15 years. Now, am I, do I work for that church? Yes, I do. But, so I... I know people have different perspectives. It's like, oh, I've been to a lot of different churches. Okay, do you know what it's like to be in one for 15 years? To see the waves and the seasons of time? You need other people. You need to come in contact with people who you know love Jesus but have arrived at different conclusions than you and go, how did you get to that? Now, you may not agree with them, but at least you see the humanity in them, the divine imprint. When I started listening to people who had different, particularly skin colors than me, instead of me telling them what their experience was really like, and I let them tell me what, my, what their experience was like, it was amazing how wider the kingdom of God got for me how multidimensional the kingdom of God got for me. I didn't stop believing in Jesus. I believed in him even harder. So when you spend time around people who spend different than you, vote different than you, listen to different music, come from different backgrounds than you, oh boy, the local church is going to be a training ground for discipleship. It's going to be a training ground for discipleship there is a very good chance that your difference in diversity is actually helping to round out the church and is the piece that needs to be added rather than the piece that needs to be removed. Acts 2.42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. They were devoted to development. They were devoted to, to it. It was not passive. It was not accidental. It was not when something came across their Facebook feed. It wasn't when they heard somebody shouting in the square. They made the intention to go and to be developed. They studied the apostles' teaching on a regular basis. Now, that's not picking up the New Testament. They were literally just hearing the apostles preach and going, all right, what did you get on your papyrus? You know, I mean, like, 
And the apostles were teaching about the Old Testament. So it wasn't, again, not just a New Testament thing. This was all the Testaments coming together. They, they, studied, the teach, they studied the sermon. That's the only way they had the teaching. They studied the sermon. And they didn't just study it to understand it. They studied it to apply it, which is why all of our discipleship communities, no matter what they do, need to be able to, need to ask three questions. What are you learning? What are you doing with what you learn? And are you applying it? And are you looking for the opportunity to share that with other people? It's one of the reasons we do not have activity-based groups. Listen, if you like bowling, go bowl. But we do not have a TNLC bowling group. What's your discipleship community? We go bowling. We go paddleboarding. We go rock climbing. You know, you know we, 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 we go fishing. Like, those are fine things. But they're not discipleship communities. It's why we don't only have prayer groups or only have Bible studies because those create too many opportunities for people to be consuming and, and, and hemming themselves into one specific way of either contributing or consuming and not being transformed. Not being transformed. I gotta be honest. I mean, uh, you know, we talk about not everybody gets to have their preference. My preference would be that every single discipleship community would be sermon based. But Matt Fucarino's in charge, and I don't get to do what I want. And I'm not shaming people if your group isn't uh, sermon based. My wife's isn't. You know, I mean, like, I don't know what that says about the sermon. But uh, <laughs> there are different times and different seasons. But what I know, I know, is that there is something about pulling apart the word of God that is being preached to this people and be able to say, what is God applying to us? Because people say, like I've heard people say so much, like, oh, I don't know if I can get fed here. I don't know if I can get fed at this church. Let me tell you something. I believe that is so less true than people make it out to be. I think when people say that, what they mean is, I want my meals on a certain platter at a certain temperature and involving certain foods only. Now, you may have to, there may be some bones in that. But you can eat around them. You can find a way to be fed. It's only because there's a plethora of other churches who are putting their stuff online, a podcast and YouTube stream, that we even know that there are even other options out there. And if you can't get fed here, why is that? It's pretty good preaching most of the time. Is there a filter that you've put on? your own heart? Is there an offense or an indifference that you've allowed to take root? Here's one thing I can promise you about that. Not every message is going to be like a bullseye, like absolutely blowing you up. I know that. My hope is that it's every Sunday is that for someone, but I don't know that that's every Sunday for everyone. But here's what I do know. I'm the primary preacher, but between the other people who are preaching here, with Pastor Kelly, Pastor Mason, Pastor David, uh, I'm trying to think of like who else, uh, you know, Matt Fucarino, Paige might even be preaching at some point in time. She probably, probably just broke out in sweat in the, in the broadcast studio right now. And other people that we have come around, not a single person prepares to preach for the world. If you're watching online, and you're just dialing around, great, but this message is not for you. I don't pray to be able to minister to people around the world. I've actually been told to make my messages more generic so they're more palatable to people around the world because they might want to find it on YouTube. And to that, I have emphatically said, no. I pray to preach to one people and one people only. Mason prays and preaches to one people and one people only. Kelly prays and preaches to one people and one people only. We are the only people in the world who can say that when we pray and prepare a message, you might get truth from other messages, you might get revelation from other messages, but let me tell you something. We are the only people who are praying and believing to minister to you and to you alone. So when you say, man, that really hit me, felt like you were speaking to me. I'm like, good, you're the one I'm aiming for. Was that about me? Anytime somebody goes, was that about me? You know what my answer is? Yes! If you were, yes, it's for you! Why are you preaching to me? Because you're here! 
Let's talk about how this Lutheran church four states away is terrible. Guys, let's tell them about all the stuff that they need to get together. No, I don't care about them. I want to know how I can serve the Wyatt family. I want to know how I can serve Mario. I want to know how I can serve the Smith family. I don't care about preaching a word to anybody else. And I know everybody else who fills this pulpit doesn't care about getting popular likes, follows, or clicks, but only serving you the word of God as best they understand that TNLC in this season and time needs to be able to receive it. That, I do believe, without a doubt, we are unique, that we are the only people praying for you and you alone. And you sit under a teaching that's you, for you, and you take time to dive into it, to discuss it, and to apply it, trust me, the local church is going to be a training ground for your discipleship, without a doubt. But how many people is it going to be for? Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. See, being a part of a local church is an opportunity for grace and patience. I mean, the church started with 3,000 people, and people were added every single day. Immediately, there were organizational challenges and problems. Immediately. The reason, how many of you have ever heard the word deacon as a part of a local church? You know why we have that? Because things went wrong and they had to figure out, like, well, is it just everybody? Do we all do all of the same things? And the, the, those who were in charge, the apostles, the elders, they said, no, we should set aside people who should be focused on this particular task. They started creating organization. They started creating hierarchy. And so if you want, I want a church without organization, without hierarchy, and without authority, you're going to have to take away the, Acts, the church of Acts that was founded by the apostles. They had to establish basic policies for who could and could not minister, who could and could not receive the daily rations of food. Paul even expands these in 1 Timothy and in Titus. He starts going, well, here's even a more clear list of who should be the leaders of the church. Here's even a more clear list of who gets food and who doesn't do that. And the reason that he's doing that is because he's trying to be able to bring help and life into things and because you just have to start having organization and structure at some point in time. And I'm sure that not everybody thought Paul was doing it right. I'm sure there were people who were looking at the apostles going, well, you can preach, but you can't hand out food. Because in some way, when you think like that, what you think is that the handing out of the food is a negative thing and somehow a lowering of the thing. In fact, the people who were handing out food, they were like, we need them to be full of the Spirit of God, full of the Word, faithful ministers. It was not who's not doing anything else it was who is faithful that we can trust. Listen, we ask you to come serve at discipleship camp. It's not like, got nothing better going on? Come to discipleship camp. You want to know how much I... My daughter got saved at one of our discipleship camps. You don't think that that is a high, holy calling? You think that serving in kids' church is less than when you might be the first person to till the soil and plant the seed of the gospel in somebody's life, and that is somehow less than because they also have snot running down their nose? I sit up here. Let me tell you, some of these people are having snot run down their nose as well. Not everybody stays awake back there. Not everybody stays awake in here either. It is not a lowering. It is a high, holy calling. And at some point, somebody has to make a decision in an organization. And any time that there is an organization with hierarchy, leadership, and humans, there will be the opportunity for mistakes to be made. How will you deal with that? I told you this is a great church. I didn't say it was a perfect church. Because I actually don't think a perfect church is absent of conflict. I think a perfect church is one that deals with conflict about as best as possible, as quickly as possible with the, with the people that there is the actual conflict with. When you get hurt, not if, when you get hurt, when you get disappointed, when somebody doesn't text you, when you don't get invited to the thing that you wanted to, when you don't invite the person to the thing that they wanted to be invited to and you just genuinely forgot, what are you going to do? Gossip, backbite, undermine? Or you speak to the people and ask the questions and be able to understand that the place isn't perfect because there is no conflict, but it becomes the way that we deal with the conflict 
together. Sounds like an opportunity for discipleship. An opportunity to grow in grace and patience. Kelly and I have been here the longest because it started in Tallahassee and none of you were there at that point in time. And over the 14, 14 plus years that I've pastored this church, I just don't know a way that it's not a mathematical certainty that I have made the most mistakes and hurt the most people through TNLC. I also don't know a way mathematically around it that I haven't been hurt the most by TNLC. Because you know that the church doesn't exist. Anytime somebody says the church, my, the next question you should ask, or anytime you say that, it should be who. And you're like, no, the church. Like, no, no, who's the church? You know, the church. No, 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 I don't. There's gotta be some secret group behind it. Isn't that what's back there in that corner? Ever since, they, ever since we put up like the curtains back there, people are like, what's back there? You know, is it the wizard who's pulling the strings? Is that the Holy of Holies? No, it's just chairs. We just thought it would be prettier than stacks of chairs. And so that is not where the church resides. There is no the church. There's only the people. I am never gonna tell you that you're not gonna get hurt here, but only that we can heal together. Doesn't that sound like the training ground for discipleship? And the local church is a beautiful, wonderful, imperfect opportunity to be a training ground for discipleship. Last one that we're gonna get to today, we're gonna hit a couple more next week. Acts 2.43, a deep sense of awe came over them all and all the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. The church learns to develop its power in persecution. It learns to develop its prayer when things are not going right and you need to be able to go to God. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but right now in our society, we are not the favorable folks. The morality that we're that we trying to be able to live out, the things that we're trying to testify for, the things we're trying to believe, we seem foolish or outdated or small-minded or bigoted. And our goal is not to be Countercultural, but Christ cultural. We want to be able to start with Christ, look at the culture around us, and say, accept, reject, and renew. We don't want to just be against everything. But guess what? We are going to have to be able to raise up in power and faith and believe for things to be able to change and transform because we don't fight with weapons of earthly warfare. We fight with power against power and principality with spiritual weapons, with our prayers, with our devotion, with our encouragement, with our love, with our belief in miracles and hope and healing for people. Let me tell you something. We're going to stand together every single time we can with any physical hurt that you have and believe for healing on this side of eternity. But if you, every time we have prayer ministers up here at the end of a service, I'm going to give you something about the service to respond to. Today, it's going to be, is there a blockage in your own heart and spirit against the local church? And for some of you, that's the thing that's going to need to get pulled out. You're going to you're going to need to lay an offense on the table. You're going to have to start under, you know, unwinding that thing so you can encounter God. And you, maybe you need to talk to somebody in the church to help heal your church wound. But some of you are great with the local church, but another part of your life is a mess or another issue is really exploding in your life. Come pray with them as well. Oh, I don't want anybody to know what's going on in my life. If you want to be treated like family, you gotta treat people like family. Whatever it is, we wanna rise up in faith with you. We wanna believe for the impossible with you. We wanna see physical healings. We wanna see addictions broken. We wanna see you set free from things. But if you're just gonna take that and walk out the door early and come in the door late, man, how can we be a family together to extend our faith and power Yes, John and Peter, they ministered in Acts chapter 3, but by Acts chapter 4, it was all the believers were gathered, filled with the Spirit of God, proclaiming the Word of God boldly. And later on, when the disciples went out, it was not just the leaders 
who were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not just the leaders. Look, I appreciate when you have, if you're a guest here and we shake hands and introduce yourself, like that's great. Or you have somebody coming like, I just wanted to meet the pastor. Fantastic. But let me tell you something. I'm not the prize. He is the prize. It's great to introduce them to a person, but make sure we're introducing them to the Savior. You know, you're like, man, I wish they could hear the gospel. And so I got to bring them to church. They're going to hear the gospel here. But are you also filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you ready to give a defense of the faith to which you have? Are you able to be filled with the Spirit of the living God and to be able to proclaim like Peter and John? Look, how can we stop speaking about the things that we have seen and heard in our own lives? It's not just the front line or the pulpit that has power. You are filled with the Spirit of the living God and the power is inside of you as well to not just attend the church, but to be the church together filled with prayer of a multitude. Those who believed Peter, what he said, they were baptized and they were added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had, They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The challenge is when you think of your Christianity as a private thing rather than a personal thing. The more private you make your faith, the less you need a public gathering. Because if you want blessing and not discipleship, you probably don't want the church. If you want teaching but not discipleship, you probably don't want the church. If you want relationship without correction, you probably don't want the church. But if you want to be more conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, you not only need the church, you want the church in your life. Because diversity happens there, because I have to actually be different, not just hypothetically different. Worship happens better. Relationship happens better. Culture happens better. Hope happens better. Help happens better. Love happens better inside the local church, which is the training ground for your discipleship. Push to be present. Don't wait to find the time. Make the time. And let the promises of God transform your life. We're going to pray in just a moment. Actually, why don't you guys, if you guys wouldn't mind standing with me. I'll give you a chance to get communion in a second. You don't need to worry about that quite yet. Uh, Prayer ministers, if you wouldn't mind coming up uh, as well. Jesus, teach us to love your bride. Jesus, teach us to love your bride. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would show us individually now if there's something, a thought, an experience, a conversation that's been planted in us, that's preventing us from experiencing the fullness of the local church. I feel left out. Maybe you're the very person to create the community you're looking for. Maybe there's a reason that that's your heart. I've been hurt. You probably have. People hurt people. Not always intentionally. But maybe it's time to put that on a person and not an entire group. 
and deal with that hurt with them. God, would you open up our hearts to receive a blessing that you have prepared for us through the local church. But we won't be able to receive it without opening up ourselves and being vulnerable to it. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your bride. Thank you for TNLC. Thank you for these people in this service. Thank you, God, for them. Help us to continue to be your church. In Jesus' name.